Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on what part of the world you're in, and welcome to XL Catlin Arctic Live. We're here at the UK Arctic Research Station in the Ollison on the island of Svalbard, and we're halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. This is an open Q&A session as part of Arctic Live, so that's where we'll be answering as many of your questions as possible about life and science in the frozen north. We're up here doing a mixture of science and outreach. We've had some great live broadcast sessions today and we've got a packed schedule next week on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, broadcasting six times a day, so hopefully something suitable for your time zone. The science we're doing up here is looking at the human impact on the ocean. So we're looking at two things. We're looking at ocean acidification and that is the process whereby carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is absorbed into the ocean and changes its pH, changes its chemistry and then that in turn can affect the animals and other life in the ocean. The second thing we're looking at is microplastics. So finding out where they are in the Arctic environment sampling in the fjord out here, you can maybe see it behind me, um, but definitely it's just out here running alongside the station and trying to also think about and find out if there is plastic in the Arctic, where does it come from? I'm joined also by Ellie. Hi Ellie, who's Hi. been behind the camera for now. Hi um, everyone. And we're going to be going through the questions that you very kindly uh, mic'd up there, sent, sent through. Ah. We've got an awful lot of questions come through, so it's going to be a quick fire round for the next 45 minutes or so. All sorts of really fantastic questions. You do keep them coming. We'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, so where should we start? Well, let's start with a, with a quite dramatic one. Have you ever fallen through the ice? I think I know the answer, but what well, would you well, do well, if you did? Wow, who's, who's that from? That We're watching great schools. It's from... Out. Fantastic. So, um, have I fallen through the ice? I, I have put a foot through the ice. The first time I was on the sea ice um, in the Arctic was at Resolute Bay um, in Arctic Canada. And I put my foot through the ice and it got rather wet. So that was fairly frightening. Um, but luckily we were quite near shore, didn't go through too far. But I did have quite a long walk um, back to where we are staying with a very soggy and very cold right foot. Um, so luckily that's the, the only time um, that I've, I've put a, a foot through the ice. Brilliant. That was from East Hampton Middle School. So this school last year was hit by a blizzard and was unable to join. Ironically it was them that were hit by a blizzard and not us. Yes. Um, so they were unable to join. So hopefully you are watching this year um, and you managed to connect and hello if you are. Um, they've also asked um, what do you eat? while you're up here, and have you had any animal encounters? Wow, what do we eat? Well, we're very lucky uh, to be here in the Ollison. The Ollison is a, a science village, the northernmost permanent community in the world. The, the settlement here used to be a, a mining settlement, now a collection of science research stations. Uh, so different countries, Norway, Germany, France, Korea, India, have research stations up here, and the UK, where we're based. But that does mean that uh, we're very well looked after. There's a central canteen um, where we get our um, meals and it's a really, really great um, food. Uh, probably one of the best canteens I think I've ever been to. Uh, perhaps the only slight difference uh, might be the reindeer on the menu from time to time. But apart from that, um, probably not that different um, from where you are. Um, and in terms of animal encounters, Wow. Um, I think one of the things is, I mean, we haven't been that close to animals up here. There's some reindeer around, some ptarmigan, arctic fox in, in previous years, quite a lot of bird life out on the fjord. Um, but what's nice is being able to observe it from a distance and not interfering too much. Um, but And uh, get a lot of questions about polar bears. Mm -hmm. uh, something we have to be very careful about, um, but no polar bear encounters so far this year. And what about not just observing wildlife, but another question um, from that same school is, uh, 
have you ever seen a glacier falling? So this is called carving, uh, where a glacier splits and big chunks of ice fall off. Have you ever seen that? I have, not in the Arctic, but in, in, in Antarctica. Um, I was in a small boat, a Zodiac, and we were um, going up and, and observing a, a, a glacier and you could sort of see it starting to carve and so we had to turn the boat around pretty sharply and there's a huge wave um, came out um, from from uh, the glacier carving. It was a spectacular sight. There's huge great blocks of ice coming off the front of the glacier. Um, so spectacular and frightening mm. in equal measure. And it makes a phenomenal noise as well, doesn't it? Like a big, like the loudest thunder rumbling you've ever heard. Well, it was just a big crack as it you know, came off, yeah. So, so um, and it's coming down. And I think the thing that was, was that this huge great wave coming out, like sort of almost like you drop the biggest bowls you can ever imagine in a pond and that sort of wave coming, coming towards us in, in, in quite a small boat. Okay. Um, you mentioned the canteen. Yes. Uh, so here we're quite well fed, but have you ever run out of food? I've never run out of food, luckily, on a polar trip. I have on a Himalayan trip. I've been, that was when I was sort of 1920 doing my first expeditions by myself across across the Pakistani Himalayas and, and managed to run out not only of food but also of water, which was a, a completely uh, numptyish um, thing to do. Um, so I walked for a day without any water and luckily got to um, a nomad encampment um, up. Um, in fact, at that time I was in, uh, over the border from Pakistan into China and they gave me a very delicious bowl of, of hot milk of some animal. I'm not quite sure. They, they had battering camels, yak and um, some sheepy goaty things. So I'm not quite sure where the hot milk came from, but it was very, very good. So, so you'd advise taking water with you? <laughs> any budding explorers out there, you, you say, don't, don't do what Jamie did. Don't do what I did. Um, plan far better. Um, and uh, yes, um, be well prepared. Plan out your meals. Take extra emergency rations. If you do take them, there should be something you don't like. Ah, uh, uh, yes, that's a very so, good point. Because if you take emergency rations that are your favourite food, you might eat them yeah. before it was an emergency. So mm -hmm. your worst, least favourite food, take as your emergency ration. What's yours? I had peanuts for a long time. I just wouldn't mm -hmm. like peanuts, but they're great because they're really high energy. Okay. Um, so I used to pack a bag of peanuts at the bottom of my bag. Um, my father's great advice was um, commando training during um, when he did his national service um, in the 50s was um, his commando sergeant told him to put a, a baked potato at the bottom of his spare sock. Um, I haven't quite got to that sort of level of, <laughs> that level of, of desperation. Um, but uh, yes, something you don't like. Okay, fantastic. So back to the Arctic then. Um, how long have we been here? And um, what's the coldest temperature we've experienced? Uh, we arrived on Monday, um, in the Arctic now Friday, and we're just here for two weeks um, to do some sampling. And it's been wonderfully, well not wonderfully, it's been weirdly warm uh, for the past few days. We've had temperatures sort of in the mid 30s Fahrenheit, so just above freezing, so two, three degrees um, Celsius. Yesterday definitely felt colder um, with the wind, it was a minus 15 um, wind chill in Celsius, and so in, in Fahrenheit that's sort of going down to 10 degrees. Um, so very, very warm. Um, the first time I was here in May, it was about minus 20 Celsius. Um, so that difference was, I, mean, I didn't pack my rain jacket. I don't have any waterproof <laughs> clothes. I've only got sort of warm clothes. So hopefully I don't get too soggy in the coming days. It's very unusual to have wet here, isn't it? Because we're normally dry. I mean, the Arctic is, is, is classified as a, as a cold desert because mm. of the lack of precipitation here. Mm. Um, the, the, the average rainfall um, patterns for Svalbard are, are similar to those of the Mojave Desert in the USA uh, and yet we had sort of rain blatting against mm -hmm. the window here um, this afternoon um, so it is, it is strange um, I don't know whether it's a long term trend or whether this is a, a blip of a year um, I, I suppose only, only time will tell okay. Brilliant um, so that was some questions from East Hampton Middle School. I do hope you managed to uh, avoid the blizzards this year and get through to us. Uh, do send in any more questions you have if you are watching. Uh, so now on to Mr Chris's second grade. This is 
uh, Michigan uh, PD Graham Elementary School. So Gage, we've had this question uh, before. Gage has said, have you ever had a moment when something really cool's happened and you've said, oh yeah, that's why I'm here. Uh, oh yeah, moments. Um, oh yeah, moments in the Arctic. The Aurora Borealis was breathtakingly beautiful. The sort of cloud, uh, not cloud, it looks like a sort of like shimmering um, sort of cloth across the sky of sort of uh, green and, and purple. Simply amazing. Um, being, in, being inside a, um, a glacier where nobody else has ever been, abseiling 150 feet down into a glacier, that was just simply spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, we'll, we'll, we'll send through some photos that we took <laughs> before it got manky, and technical <laughs> term manky for the weather. Uh, um, the view out, out, out at the back uh, is absolutely stunning looking from the UK research station, looking from the Olsen down towards Kronsvegen. Uh, and the Trey Krona, which is these wonderful three sort of triangular pyramidal peaks. So really, really sort of oh yeah moments. There's, there's definitely just the view from here. And the uh, abseiling into the glacier we yes. have on our website, don't we? A fantastic 360 degree view of abseiling into a crevice surrounded by ice. It really is fabulous, so do check that out. Yeah, so we have these things called moulins, um, which is where melt water on the surface of a glacier find a gap and makes a sort of vertical shaft. Um, this one was 150 feet down and I had an abseil for a number of years uh, and so I sort of stood at the top of this thing with my crampons <laughs> on and holding onto a rope with a 360 degree camera on my back. I probably said some things that probably weren't suitable um, for an educational audience um, at the time but the video um, is on our YouTube channel 360 video so if you want to get a feel um, for what it's like, grab a mobile phone, go to the YouTube channel, and, and if you can, use a mm. Google Cardboard compatible um, VR headset and get a feel for what it's like um, to go down. It really is amazing, yeah. very immersive experience. Uh, right, so um, another question from PD Graham Elementary School. Uh, which foods do you really miss uh, having out during expeditions? Presumably not peanuts. <laughs> not, not peanuts. Um, what what food do I miss? I, I think that it's uh, it's it's okay here. I think when you're sort of out on a, on a, on a field camp, you definitely miss crunchy things. Everything mm. tends to be a bit of a mush. I mean, amazing uh, mush uh, considering <laughs> where we were. Um, stews and then the stew becomes a soup, and then you put dehydrated cheese into it to get another sort of few hundred calories, and that kind of thing. But you miss things like apples and fresh fruit mm. and salad. Um, oh, good salad. Good crunchy salad, and that's definitely not happening up here. Yeah, I miss it. I miss it. Cucumber. Cucumber. It's nice crunchy cucumber. Um, so that was thank you from Aidan. That was a good question. And another great question here from Rianne. Uh, do you prefer working in the cold, or wouldn't you prefer to be somewhere warm? Well, I'm I'm very lucky um, in so far as I work on a number of projects, um, including coral reef projects. Um, so I do get the chance to go to warm places, but I do quite like <laughs> the Arctic. If you had to, if you had to pick one place to be forever, if you had to one place, one, to, one place to be forever. You can well, only come probably, here or oh, oh right, in terms of expedition, yeah. rather than sort of being with my family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're, you're allowed to be with your family, but um, so poles or equator? Poles. Oh, that's poles. a quick answer. Easy, easy. It, dry, cold, absolutely fine. You just have to have the right togs on. Um, the human, equatorial, lots of stingy, bitey things. No. Um, as far, here, it's a polar bear, and that's the one thing. And all or nothing. All or nothing. <laughs> and you've got your flare pistol with you, you scare it away. There's all the training. But sort of bitey, like jellyfish the size mm. of a thimble that can kill you with one sort of like hello or... Um, sea snakes or saltwater crocodiles or shark, all this kind of stuff. The big thing you don't want to do in Australia, that's what you're saying. I have done a trip <laughs> on the Great Barrier Reef. I can tell you there's everything. I Never go snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef with a beard because you get bits of stingy sort of tentacle mm. trapped in your beard. And that, 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 there's a top, top sort of swimming tip, Good expedition advice. tip. <laughs> Good advice there. Um, thank you. And Kira says, when you're not doing scientist stuff, uh, what sort of games do you play or what do you do for fun? What do we do for fun? That's a, a really great question. Um, so 
you can have quite a lot of fun on um, an expedition um, like this up in the Arctic. Uh, we have had some celebrations up here. Um, so a few big celebrations, Sol Fest, when the sun comes back over the mountains for the first mm -hmm. time. Um, that's a great. Everybody's ready for it, aren't they? Everybody's ready for it, especially the people who've overwintered here. So the big party mm -hmm. um, then. Um, Norwegian National Day on the 17th of May. So if you're up, up here for that, that's a, that's a great fun mm. um, time as well. And and then there's, there's you have uh, sort of, this is pleased as sort of magnets or collect people with amazing stories. Um, Nick, our station manager, has got wonderful stories. He's been working in the polar regions for over 40 years. Mm. And, you know, Ellie's been to amazing places and the, the other members of the team have been to amazing places. So a lot of you know, relaxation is, is really sort of getting to the end of the day, having a cup of tea and, and swapping the stories um, when we're not doing the science stuff. I think it's really nice because there's no TV and because the internet's limited, actually we go back to a very primitive way of life of sort of almost sitting around the campfire telling stories. That's yeah. how it has been for generations. And it's really nice to just talk and listen and, and tell stories. So, um, yeah, it's good fun. Um, and Nora... Uh, yeah. from uh, Michigan PD Graham Elementary. Nora said, have you ever had a scary encounter with any animals in the Arctic? Not not um, in the Arctic, no, no scariness in, <laughs> in, in the Arctic. You can feel nervous about polar bears because they can just literally just come out of nowhere practically. You know, there's one that could come out of the sea, you know, hop, skip and a jump and be at the back door here. Um, <laughs> but so just, just check out, just check outside the window. Um, but I think I think that uh, the big danger here is is the, the climate, um, and that's everything from from the cold all the way to the the sort of weather changing. There being complete lack of visibility, and you're out on a glacier on a skidoo, and you can't see you know one foot, two foot in front of you, and you have to get off and sort of walk and sort of mm -hmm. follow along in, in the skidoo. That that can be quite scary. But animal encounters, you know, a, a rogue duck. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't quite sort of you know, hack it in terms of you know fer ferociousness um, up here. But I think it's it's very true what you say about the weather. The weather here almost, in a way, is its own beast. It's a, it's a different type of animal, isn't it? It definitely has a character and a presence. You're aware of the weather's grip at all times and how quickly it can change. It's not like somewhere else where you can think, oh well, I'll, I'll take a coat or an umbrella and I can beat the weather. Here, the weather is in charge, so that's, that's more def scary than yeah. animals. I definitely felt like that on my first Arctic trip, um, where we had temperatures um, between averaging sort of 30 below, mm -hmm. um, which is about 20, 25 below in, in, in Fahrenheit. Um, and so anywhere between so zero to, to negative 40 Fahrenheit, um, which is minus 20 to minus 40 Celsius. And you're right, it did feel like a wild animal. Any any gap, any bit of um, skin that wasn't covered, you know, with the wind's up, you really felt it was mm -hmm. almost clawing at you, sort of biting, stinging, cold. Um, it's worse than really the jellyfish then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so on to Jonesville Middle School in the US. Yeah. Um, so... Have explorers had any issues with global warming melting the ice and causing problems for food chain or have to help polar bears attacking them for food? So has there been conflict as a result of the melting ice or warmer earlier summers? Has there been a conflict between man and uh, animal polar bears living in the same place? I mean, I'm not sure for Swalbard. I think I've heard some some um, anecdotes from, from Canada where they're seeing polar bears coming mm. more into to communities at a bit more and, and certainly there's this sort of anecdotal evidence mm. about po uh, polar bears and grizzlies um, mixing where you get the pizzlies and the growers um, if, if, if they if they mate. Um, here um, hearing about how the lack of sea ice which is the hunting platform for the polar bear going after seal what what we're hearing is that you'll find polar bears going after eggs and fledglings of the young birds um, as, as a sort of a behavioural adaptation mm -hmm. from there being a lack of sea ice. So that, that's more, that's what we're finding here. Um, and, you know, that's, well, you know, have yet to find out what the long-term impact is, but it's essentially your diet going from hog roast to scrambled eggs, 
Mm -hmm. um, and you know, how many plates of scrambled eggs do you have to get through to make up for a whole roast? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the kind of feel feel for it. And that's a, a good example of how climate change is directly impacting food webs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. So I mean, the, the pressure that you know, in terms of the exploration in the Arctic, you know, will somebody ever be able to walk from land to the North Pole ever again? Mm. Uh, will there mm -hmm. be enough sea ice um, for that to happen? All the ice conditions to be suitable for that? Do you ha how far will you have to swim if mm -hmm. you wanted to, as an Arctic explorer, walk from, say, northern Russia or northern Canada or Greenland to the to the North Pole? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, those kind of questions. Um, so people who have been here for for a long time. I've, I've only been coming here um, for about five years. People are coming here for for decades have really noticed the changes, and mm -hmm. there's an um, is a headland, which in fact is an island opposite us, which people thought was a headland, but as the uh, um, glaciers retreated, they find out it is in fact an island. So there's some really surprising things like that, you know, mm -hmm. the landscape visibly changing. Sure. And you mentioned um, storytelling earlier, and one of the people here, Nick Cox, who's our station manager at the British base here, uh, is one of those storytellers. He is um, going to be on live with us next week yeah and he's been here for years and years and years and we can yeah. talk perhaps a little bit more about some of those changes exactly he, he came here to set up the uk station in 1991 so he's got that um trying to do my maths now it's a 27 year sort of mm -hmm. view of, of changes um in Svalbard. um but um you know it's it's really difficult to say i could say you know in 2014 2015 it was much colder we had you know negative 15 to 20 mm. sort of you know around zero degrees fahrenheit and you know this year it's not um but without looking at that long-term long trend, trend yeah exactly. um which is what you know we can't just say you know this year was warmer than last year and all cold or whatever it is we have to look at that long-term mm. trend so it'd be great that's, to, that's what a lot of the scientists here are looking at they're adding data continually to to many many years and decades of, of trends and it's only once you see that pattern that you can sort of reliably say yes there is a, a, a warming or long-term long -term change. Thank you for that question and uh, Susan Poletso, also from Jonesville Middle School, has said um, have the explorers, now this is a good one, have the explorers made any frozen treats like homemade popsicles? Oh, I wish, I wish. <laughs> what, I mean what I want to know is what flavour should we make. Mm. So, send uh, your ideas. Send then. your ideas, we probably won't have that flavour but we could maybe bring it next year and make yeah. popsicles. The other thing is we can't make popsicles at the moment. Yeah, no, it's too warm. Because it's too warm. I was really looking forward to making ice cream outside. And it's too warm. Yeah. Next year. Next year, hopefully, hopefully. we'll be crossed. back to, to, to cold. But let us know, Susan, which flavour you would recommend if you were up here. Uh, Whitney Sweeney has asked, how deep is the snow in the Arctic area? And also, which animals are camouflaged in the snow? <laughs> um, which, how deep is the snow? Not very deep. We've had sort of mm -hmm. three days of, of, of pretty sort of bad melt. Um, so it's currently looking like a muddy slush puppy um, outside at the moment. Um, so not not great. Um, our uh, uh, nearby Arctic fox has also decided that white is no longer the colour of the season. is starting to turn to the greyish um, brown as well. So um, that's sort of moving into our next question of which animals um, are, are white. So you have sort of reindeer, which is sort of whitish brown, you have the Arctic fox, you have some bird life um, that um, is either white or mottled, so white, a little bit of um, white and dark. Examples of that are the um, ptarmigan, um, which is like a big grouse um, type bird, um, schnabel in, in, in German, um, which means snow chicken. So I thought it was quite amusing. I was here with an Austrian team, but otherwise it's a pretty random word to know. <laughs> um, and of course a polar bear, um, this, you know, white um, and disguised, all sort of like a pale cream colour mm. um, disguised against the snow. Fantastic. Um, Oakwood Avenue School in New Jersey. Uh, Latricia has asked, what kind of experiments do you run? Uh, that's a, a, a great question. So I think the interesting thing to, to you know, do scientists do experiments um, with field work, it's a little bit different from that. Um, so having mentioned earlier that we're doing the social acidification and this microplastics work, 
So up here, what we're looking at, we're asking a question, you know, is, you know, how is the chemistry of the fuel changing? Mm -hmm. um, and then how might that affect the animals that live here? And so we have those questions and to answer those questions, we're going to take samples of seawater from different depths and we're going to test that to see what the chemistry is like, what the pH is like. And then we can do that over a number of years and, and sort of identify mm. one of these trends mm. um, that we we're talking about earlier. And also that's the same with looking at uh, how the settlement of different animals in different um, chemistries might be changing over that period as well. So it's, it's a lot of observation. Mm -hmm. and, and the experiments that they're actually doing in terms of the tests, they're relatively simple and they may be similar to tests that you might do in your science classes at school. So measuring pH with the uh, litmus paper. Now we might have a bit more scientific electronic probes but essentially it's the same thing and measuring temperature is as simple as using a thermometer and measuring salinity is using um, looking at conductivity. So the, the science behind it is actually quite straightforward but it gives us a lot of information. Yeah and I think that that's a very good point Ellie and I think you could do a number of these types of experiments um, at school. You could think about how does a change in the environment affect living things in my school grounds or, or, in, or in a place near, near my school? And you might do something as simple as um, does uh, temperature affect when uh, a tree blossom or flowers mm. come out? Or um, does um, the number of flowers, you know, or the wildness of an area affect the number of bees? And you can look sure, at different yeah. ways. Of, and it's looking at those relationships and those correlations, how does one thing affect another? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you can start to draw conclusions and understand how our world works a bit better. And, and in terms of our research here, that human impact story, sharing that with a wider audience and then that wider audience, whether it's on an individual community or national basis, deciding how to act sure. um, with that new information. I think it's, it's a really interesting point to make as well that you can do these experiments on a very small scale. It can be just your back garden or, or looking at temperature of the water in your school pond, for example. And that's exactly the same system that you'd use on a bigger lake. And of course, here in the fjord where we're going down to about 300 meters. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, out into the global open ocean, the deep ocean as well. So it's the same idea of just looking at patterns and observation and change. I think that, that's right. I mean, I think people ask, you know, how can I become a polar scientist on these mm -hmm. things? I think one of the things you can do is, 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 is learn how to observe and record nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's a really, really good, good start. Mm -hmm. start. Start paying attention and recording and observing and experimenting. Exactly. Um, okay, so thank you very much. That was um, Latricia's question. And um, Gloria Campillo asked a very similar question about what evidence do you collect for your experiment. So hopefully that answered your question as well, Gloria. Thank you for that. Um, Dayona has asked, how long do you have to stay there to get the information for your experiments? Uh, so we're here for just two weeks. It's quite a short field period. Um, typically using a research station here for between sort of two and six weeks. And then there's some longer um, sort of field-based research which where people come up for a number of months and stay here. So this, this time in the Arctic is only probably a fifth or less of the actual science work that we're doing. So the samples, the water samples that we take and we'll collect um, water samples and plastic samples of RNA through, through trawling, all that goes back to a university in the UK mm. and then further tests are done there. Mm. So yes, we're here for, you know, probably 10 days of actual field work, two of which have been um, gone up the spout with rain, <laughs> um, but these 10 days are only a small part of the overall sort of science work that we're doing this year. It is worth saying as well that those 10 days are packed with very concentrated experiments. So when we did go out in the boat the other day, a few days ago, um, each site we were taking seven different depths, taking two to four samples from each, we did five different sites. So you're getting lots of data in each one of those then is divided into several jars so you get repeats of all of your seawater samples. So you can actually gather quite a lot of information in quite a short time.
Yeah, you're, you're definitely not focusing or prioritizing sleep when you're out here. Um, it's, it's, it's a great privilege to be out here. Um, there's a, the funding issues so that, you know, if uh, you've got funding for, for two weeks, so you come out here and you do as much work as you can in, in those two weeks. Right, uh, polar bears then. Let's answer this once and for all. Are polar bears going extinct? Have we seen a decrease in polar bears uh, in the last, in recent years? Um, since the mid-70s, uh, so since 1973 when hunting was banned in the wildlife, that's actually allowed uh, the bear population to increase. Mm. Um, so we can see what the lovely um, thing about that is that we can see if we change your attitude to wildlife and to nature, actually, nature can recover. Uh, but the flip side of that is that recovery um, could now be affected by habitat loss, and we talked about that earlier. It's, it's tricky to attribute climate change to, you know, individual mm -hmm. um, deaths of individual uh, animals. Um, but what we, what we can say is that the loss of habitat is putting pressure um, on, and on, 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 on the polar bear. And, and, and you can use that sort of analogy of, you know, it's, you have to, as a polar bear, expend more energy to find that seal. Mm -hmm. um, you have to expend more energy to get how many eggs and fledglings rather than a seal. So it's it's not the best of times. And we'll see what the impact is that on the population, on, that, on, on population. So time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah. Uh, and time will tell if we decide uh, to change our habits mm. um, and slow the decrease okay. of sea ice loss. Yeah. Okay, right, quick fly around. Yes. We've got questions coming in from Dan Rees from Target Range School in the States. Uh, how many layers do you normally wear? Normally, I wear three or four layers. At the moment, I've got basically essentially a sort of woolen t-shirt on and then this jacket. Um, so unseasonably warm um, at the moment, normally sort of three or four layers. Uh, what does the extreme weather feel like? Extreme really really horrible <laughs> um really horrible uh so biting wind minus 40 just it just feels like i mean i remember one day where i was filming at minus 40 and it felt like uh, my face was being sandblasted with ice ice mm. blasted um and just this stinging 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 sensation you just have to get on with it um so really really tough and uh, in contrast, what's the warmest it's been here? Probably well, today. <laughs> warmest being while I've been here is, is probably today. Um, temperatures get up to sort of 10 degrees, 15 degrees in the summer, so that's about 50, 60 Fahrenheit. Mm. Um, okay, Reagan has asked a good question. How does it feel moving from Bermuda to the Arctic? So I was in very, um, luckily I was in Bermuda uh, in November last year, which was wonderful. Um, great to see the a very very healthy parrotfish population there the called parrotfish capital of the world uh and you know in between calls here we sort of uh, make up tea and stay warm there i sort of jump into the water and have it all scooch around um they're both the coral reef and the polar region both very wonderful um ecosystems and i feel very privileged to be able to work in both of them and following on from that Apart from the weather, what's your favourite part of the Arctic? And this, this question actually also mentions Antarctica as well. So, you know, what's the difference between Arctic and Antarctic? And what's your favourite part of the Arctic? Uh, so very quickly, the difference between the Antarctic and the Arctic. The Antarctic is a continent surrounded by sea. The Arctic is a sea and ocean surrounded by continents. Um, uh, they are both deserts. Um, so they are both experience very low precipitation, snowfall, rainfall. Um, sadly, more rainfall now than it used to be. <laughs> um, and um, they both uh, have bonkers lights in the sky. Um, so when you get ice particles in the sky, you get sort of sun dogs and uh, sun columns and, and all these types of things. Um, uh, up in the north, um, you get the aurora borealis. Um, so what was the second half of that question? That was the, the difference. Uh, the between difference between the two and what's your favourite part of the Arctic? I think it's the light. 
the light is, 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 I mean, whether it's the lights, northern lights, the, the aurora, whether it's the times when the air can freeze and it's like walking through a cloud of diamonds, um, whether it's the, the sun dogs and the sun columns, all these things. It's, uh, here it's like being in the sort of, like being a human sort of, sort of um, sun clock, you know, you can sun dial, you've got the sort of, the sun just going on a big sort of mm -hmm. lopsided loop um, around the sky. Yeah, definitely the light. Um, Asha, very important question. Do you have hot chocolate and coffee? Asha, uh, no hot chocolate, although I do believe we could probably sort of find some hot chocolate. I'm sure, I'm I'm sure, sure the Norwegians have got some. Um, you can steal some from there. The coffee uh, isn't. This is this is my own <laughs> puppet, isn't it? Um, the co I have experienced better coffee. <laughs> that's I a think, polite way of putting it. I think that's... that's um, <laughs> I always mean to bring my own coffee with me and I always sort of fill that coffee shaped space um, with another bit of camera equipment or other equipment or something mm. warm. I could have I could have I could have not brought a fleece this year and brought coffee. Got I coffee didn't know. Um, mm. Next year. Next year. Um, it will be cold and I'll have coffee. <laughs> Sophia has asked, you've already mentioned this, have you ever seen an Arctic fox? Um, Sophia, there's a very sweet Arctic fox that lives by the kitchen. Um, I think it's rather hoping for kitchen scraps, very bad to feed wild animals. Um, so please don't do it. Um, but I think it lives in hope um, that something might appear. Maybe some good smells emanating from, from the kitchen. So it's very sweet and got a really nice photograph a couple of years ago. And you can check that out on our Instagram page. I think page. it's on our Instagram Still page. On our Instagram. We'll try and, we'll try and over it. the weekend, we'll, we'll repost some stuff. Really and, and we'll, we'll, and um, get it up on Twitter and Facebook as well. Okay, right, some questions from Children's International School in Lagos in Nigeria. Uh, of all the places in the world, why did you choose the Arctic for your research work? Really important question here. I think just looking at ocean acidification and plastics, um, ocean acidification is happening probably twice as fast in the Arctic um, than in any other part of the ocean. So by studying what's happening here, we can sort of, you know, it acts a bit like an early warning system mm -hmm. for what might happen mm -hmm. uh, in other oceans. On the plastic side, um, it's really looking at how pervasive is this plastics problem? Is it is it everywhere? And if it is getting into places like the Arctic Ocean, where's it coming from? Um, so it's really getting that global mm -hmm. picture. You know, you look out here and, it, you know, you feel this should be a pristine environment and we've yet to get out of trawl properly. Um, but I saw sort a of paper published last week or the week before showing that the large amounts of microplastics in the sea ice. So mm. I hope it's that weird thing. I hope we don't find any mm. plastics um, because that would be great that somewhere we're still pristine. Um, but I, I, th I think we might. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, just seeing how much and where it comes from. And why specifically, because if the poles are more of an early warning signal because they're more affected. Um, by these changes. Is there a reason why the North Pole and the Arctic is uh, more preferable for climate research than the South and the Antarctic? I, mean, I think it really depends what, what um, questions you're asking. Certainly the Arctic Ocean, um, you know, if, if, if uh, currents are bringing, bringing uh, plastics into the Arctic Ocean, there's not really anywhere for them to go sort of mm. from, from mm. here. If, they're, if, they're, if it's providing a, what's called a sink um, um, where, where, where these particles are, are collecting, um, and in, in terms of um, the ocean acidification piece, uh, it, it, it is also, um, you know, we've got the, the fact that gas to, you know, to say dissolves in, in colder waters mm -hmm. um, more, more readily, and uh, it's quite easy to get here. A little bit easier, isn't little it? It still takes a while, yes. but it's certainly easier than Antarctica. Okay, brilliant. So then a couple, couple of related questions as well, also from Children's International School in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, so do you think we can create suitable conditions to live permanently up here? And related to that is uh, how do we get our electricity? Great question. The people do live permanently here. Mm -hmm. This is in fact the northernmost permanent community um, in the world. Um, people live living here the whole year round. And in, as humans, we we use technology to provide our adaptation. Mm -hmm. So whether that's 
clothing technology or shelter or whatever it might be. And in terms of power, there's a, a diesel power station just over this way. And that's where the electricity comes from, just on the basis that finding renewable form of electricity in these conditions is, has proven really, really tough. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question about living up here. Um, how do you move from one place to another um, by not trekking? Um, they've said, I think, if you use a car, it would get stuck in the ice. Um, a car could work out stuck, so so there are a few options here. I've um, got boats um, when we, we can get out on, on the fjord. I've got snowmobiles, skidoos to get around um, on the snow, and then planes and helicopters for, for longer or more difficult journeys. So those are the options, yeah. So there are some cars that just go around the village, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, going in between, say, the power station and accommodation or up towards uh, the airstrip. Um, I'm not going to call it an airport, because <laughs> it's sort of like a sort of landing strip. Landing strip, yeah. 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 And, and a related question: What's the population up here? Well, it really changes. I think it's about thirty-five in the winter, and then up to a hundred plus as physician scientists come up um, in the summer. Okay, and this is a really interesting question as well. Um, what can they do in Nigeria from their side of the planet in Africa? What can they be doing to help the work or, or the impacts up here in the Arctic? I think it's, it's a great question and, and it's interesting to think how connected um, we are. So if we're looking at the impacts of uh, plastic pollution, um, which is um, seaborne, um, and we're looking at the impact of the ocean acidification, which is um, driven by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, those are two things that um, anybody anywhere in the world um, yeah, can, take, global, can, can take action on. Especially carbon dioxide, there's a system-wide issue. Um, mm. It doesn't doesn't recognise national borders. The carbon dioxide you produce in Nigeria doesn't just stay over Nigeria. So all these things of, of reducing our carbon footprint, uh, cutting down on, on single-use plastics, all these things help. So the actions you take to look after your local environment in Nigeria are the same ones that are going to help um, the Arctic as well. Mm. So thank you for, for making a start. Yes, definitely. A uh, couple, of, couple of related questions again. Um, some really thoughtful questions coming in here. Uh, so firstly, if it's daytime 24 hours a day, yes. uh, why is it still cold uh, when the sun should be out? And similarly to that, how do plants grow in the Arctic region, especially when it's dark for six months of the year? Brilliant. Um, so just on the the first one on the um, so that that was the twenty four hour daylight, mm. but still not getting that. Yeah, warm. Surely it would warm up if you had sun for twenty four hours. Why is it not getting warmer? Yeah, I think I think what you need to do is if you can get a um, a globe uh, and a torch um, and you shine your globe with a torch and you see how much um, light is covered by the torch shining at the globe and you see that if you've got the equator you're actually getting quite a lot of concentrated sunlight. As soon as you get to sort of where it's a bit side on mm. and the, the sun's low in the sky, mm. it's, you, just, skimming it's just skimming so you're not actually surface. getting as much um, solar energy per, per area. Um, so that, mm. that, that'll be one of the reasons why the polar, polar regions are, yeah. are less Less warm. And so, how do the plants grow then? If there's such limited, if the sunlight that Not is very here is well. very weak, yeah, they go very, very <laughs> so slowly. Very so we, small. As you can see, there isn't a massive forest out, yeah. outside, um, but some beautiful little little plants that, that will grow once the, the, the snow is melted. Okay. Uh, another great question, uh, also still from Nigeria. Uh, what course could one study to become a researcher in the Arctic region? So, any students who are thinking they want to following your footsteps? Um, that's a great question. So I think if you're looking at the natural sciences, that's great. There's a lot of atmospheric sciences. Um, there's some avionics engineers mm -hmm. up here um, working on some of the, the radio telescopes. Um, there is a course of the geographic disciplines. Um, geology um, might be one. Um, and glaciology, so geography, geology, um, engineering, um, and the sciences. Um, all suitable to get up here and you can specialise as you go through university and then into uh, postgraduate research. Fantastic. 
We're going to jump over to the live chat because there's some great questions coming through and we've got some return uh, viewers as well, some students who are with us this morning. Um, so uh, Graham Plant, who's the Plants for Class from the C.C. Carruthers Public School in London, Ontario. Welcome yeah. back. Um, you're joining again this time grade one and two and the grade three class. Um, so uh, permanent population you've already answered. Um, what kind of animals in general live in the Arctic? Um, one more question. This one's good. If time, do you build igloos? Um, I've, I've built a dogloo. <laughs> a dogloo? <laughs> I built a dogloo in the Canadian Arctic for our um, polar bear guard dog, Took. I made him a little dogloo. Um, so that was quite fun. Uh, all depends on what kind of snow you have. Um, so you've got to have nice sort of hard snow, good, good sort of snow good box of snow, not too um, powdery, um, and definitely not the slush um, that we have outside at the moment. So I think we'd be hard pushed um, to make an igloo at the moment, but making the dog was great fun. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, right, back to um, Nigeria for the last couple of questions. I think there's some, there's some, so many come through, so I'm sorry we haven't got to ask all of them, but we will be doing more um, Ask Me Anything, more Q&A. So, do come back and try and answer the rest another time. But just to finish off, um, question about um, internet reception, phone calls. Yeah, I mean, up here, uh, you're not allowed any mobile phones on, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, anything like that. It's a lot of very sensitive scientific equipment. Uh, and one of the reasons for being in the Olesund is that you can do your research and it's not interfered with by, by all these different signals that are part of modern life. Um, but the great thing is, the other side of that, is that, that sending all the data back to research institutes around the world, there is a fibre optic line, so we're sort of piggybacking off that. There's no mobile phone coverage, um, but there is um, a great uh, fibre optic cable uh, which we can use to be able to talk to you guys. Fantastic. Yeah. And just a final question, nice quick one. Um, how this is a common question. How do you have a bath in the morning? Um, how do you have a bath in the morning? I prefer showers and um, for those of you who are un unacquainted with showers, um, you sort of open the door um, <laughs> and then there's two knobs. There's one that gives you water and the other one that controls the temperature. You get those just right, you uh, close off, get in, soap up, rinse, uh, um, um, that, that kind of thing. And then moment turn that off, dry yourself, and, and then carry on with the day. <laughs> Being a bit flippant, we're, we're very, very lucky here to, to have um, great facilities. Um, if you're in a tented field camp, mm. uh, then it is a, um, a question of being um, slightly uh, pongy. Um, for a number of weeks, so not very many changes of clothes, not very many no washing, bathing mm. opportunities. Mm. But everybody's all not washing at the same time, so I guess you're all and, really stinky. And, it's, and well, it's also not too stinky if it's cold. Yeah, because you're not sweating. You can't. Too. You can't. Well, you can't smell it so much mm. in the cold. Um, and we remember being on the aeroplane out and the pilot very kindly thought, thought he was being very kind, switched on the heating oh, okay. in our section of the plane. Um, and uh, we sort of shouted, quick, turn it off, turn it off. You know, we haven't washed in how many weeks, it was going to sort of warm us up and the general pong would have probably you know, made us want to jump out of the aeroplane. So um, we turned the heating off, that, that was lucky. So you can get quite pongy after a number mm. of weeks without washing on the ice. And it takes you a few baths or showers to... Uh... Three when you get back. Yeah, fairly grey. Um, grey um, water. Grey water, Ooh. yeah. So there's things, things you probably don't need to know about <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the behind the scenes part of, of Arctic um, exploration and science. Fantastic. So I think that's a perfect note <laughs> to end on. We're thinking about Jamie's smelly grey water baths that he recovers from his trips. Um, so I'm going to pop round to the camera so I can just uh, finish off the session. Wonderful. So I'll leave it with Jamie. Thank you very much for those questions and do keep sending more in because we do have more AMAs that Jamie will tell you about now. Um, well, thank you um, so, so much um, for taking part in this live Q&A from the Arctic as part of Excel Cap and Arctic Live. We've got a great lineup for next week. 
We've got Nick Cox interviews, we've got open Q&As, we've got Keeping Warm Investigations on Monday. On Tuesday, we've got um, Katie Smith, we've got some ocean acidification work. Uh, Thursday, Nick Scott and some plastic sampling, and then we've got um, Ellie um, being interviewed, her turn to, to answer some questions on Thursday and a look at how different types of ice melting might affect sea level rise. So do join us uh, for all those all on the Digital Explorer YouTube channel and really hope to see you online. But for now, it's goodbye from Arctic Live and goodbye from the UK Arctic Research Station. Have a great weekend wherever you are.